And now I would like to invite the first presenter, Olga Runsema from Denmark, who is a clinical psychologist and an activist in the Hearing Voices movement. She has her own practice in Copenhagen and is one of the few who openly tells she has a speciality in working with the people experiencing psychosis. Welcome. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for inviting me. It's a huge privilege and I am extremely grateful. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I, as uh, uh, Hannah was saying, I'm a psychologist. Um, I'm also chair of the Danish Hearing Voices Network. Um, and uh, I have also been in psychiatry myself. In fact, I was diagnosed as a as a schizophrenic and I was in the system for 10 years and I was defined as chronic and uh, uh, there was no possibility of uh, regaining my uh, health. In fact, I was on the highest pension. So I like to look at myself as a kind of a bridge builder. One of the things I wanted to do uh, when I was in the system was to talk about the things that had happened to me and I was told that as a schizophrenic talking with a psychologist was a bad thing, it would make me even worse. So uh, when I came out of the system, I decided to become a psychologist and uh, begin to help all those that have been told that they will have no uh, possibility of any uh, help from a psychologist, and I don't believe that at all. In fact, I'm the uh, first and only one in Denmark who is working in private practice uh, with a speciality in what we call psychosis. I'm going to be trying to talk a little bit about the ordinary life and the everyday. And uh, most people who know me, they know me as an, as an uh, activist. Uh, certainly people who've just heard of me. Then there are those who actually know me a little bit uh, better. And uh, they know also why I'm an activist. And why I, uh, I'm very critical about uh, uh, drugs, about forced treatment, and about the diagnostic system. Because I think it is, on the whole, uh, very, very harmful. Um, but very few people actually know anything about what I really do when I work with people. And that's actually what I want to talk a bit about today. Um, just a little bit before, I've got my colleagues here, they've got many friends. Um, they have, many of them have done all the research and have been looking at that, so um, I'm going to try and create a little bit of a backdrop by being personal uh, uh, to, to sort of complement much of the, the things that they will be talking about uh, during the day. But first, um, I, I uh, often, I wrote a thesis on uh, post-psychiatry and, and uh, the consequences of uh, being on drugs. Um, and I interviewed uh, seven people and uh, did, a, did a qualitative um, questionnaire and discussed with them the effects of being on psychiatric drugs. And one of the interesting things I, I also found out was that the research that has been done from the 1950s to the end of 2012, uh, less than, well, 0.1% of the research had actually asked about people's subjective <clears throat> experience of being on psychiatric drugs. In other words, the research was all top down and it all told about how psychiatry and, and the dominant society uh, thought psychiatric drugs uh, worked and how people experienced them. And, uh, decided to call um, non-compliance as a sign of uh, a symptom of illness rather than actually asking the people of why they try to stop taking the drugs. I need to say a little bit about post-psychiatry because that's what's on the brochure. So I'm going to rush through that. So it's going to be very sort of uh, very quick. Um, it has many similarities, I think, to uh, open dialogue, which uh, some of my colleagues from there are also going to be speaking later today. Uh, but we, we look at it as that there are many truths. Um, the Hearing Voices movement is, uh, I think, the epitome of, uh, of uh, post-psychiatry. We, we do not define other people's experiences, nor do we tell them what their truths are. There's many, many understandings, many truths. And uh, I'm actually thinking that there's an awful lot of people who are listening to me uh, and also hearing voices in their ears and they're hearing it in a different language, so you're actually, in a way, voice hearers. <laughs> so, um, 
Psychiatry tends to have one truth. They're very much rooted in the uh, age of enlightenment. I've taken it from Pat Bracken and Philip Thomas. Uh, they're a very interesting uh, book. I have a picture of it just in a minute. Um, but I'm going to sum up post-psychiatry through the use of my, I love my avocado and my onion. And uh, psychiatry is the avocado. And uh, the rest of us are the onion. So, there you are. This is what psychiatry believes. They're trying to find the gene, the, the biochemical defect, the, the, the neurotransmitter that's gone wrong. So they're sort of all looking at this. And then they dig out, they try to find it inside the person. And they scrape away all context and meaning and that sort of thing. It becomes meaningless because you're trying to find what is wrong as if it was the most simple thing in the world. It's a gene. And we've looked for that for years. What many others believe, also many of you, including myself, that there is nothing about us without context, without meaning, without understanding. What we're looking at is that we do not function without this context. We have a sort of democratic emphasis on uh, different perspectives. We have meaning as primary. We have relationships. We have uh, ethics, I think is very important. So this was a super, super quick, uh, uh, I don't know, analysis of post-psychiatry. So if you want to more, uh, know more, I'd actually recommend this book. It's uh, very, very interesting, and I uh, chose to base my thesis on it. Now, why do I think these things are important? One of the things I think is uh, that we completely neglect uh, in, um, in psychiatry, or very often neglect, is the stories that people have with them, the reason why they often end up in psychiatry. Many people have a story of trauma. And in fact, people labeled schizophrenic uh, often have dreadful stories of trauma with them. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, John Reed, who you will be hearing later, has focused very much is the relationship between psychosis and uh, trauma. And um, also, one of the things that psychiatry, traditional academic psychiatry, dreams of is to find a true relationship between, for example, genetics. And if they could find a dosage relationship, well, wow. But the strange thing is, we can find it with trauma. And all, all of the research that's looked at this shows this. And I believe, perhaps John Reed can correct me on that, but I believe that every single piece of research, bar one, that's looked at uh, dosage effect, uh, has shown that the more you are exposed to, the more likely you are to be psychotic. And just to take this one, if you've experienced three types of trauma, and they're typical things like bullying, sexual abuse, violence, neglect, death, these sort of things that are very traumatic as a child. If you've experienced three of them, you are 18 times more likely to be uh, psychotic and, be a, and enter into psychiatry. But if you've experienced all five, you're 193 times more likely. These are results that are screaming in your face. This is one of the ones that shows it very, very clearly. Uh, others don't show it quite so, so strongly, but it is there, every single piece of research. We have our Thomas Vail, who's, very, uh, who's done a lot of research in genetics in Denmark. Um, he was, became very popular a couple of years ago with a big uh, piece of research, and it was in the newspapers for over a year where the discussion on, on whether schizophrenic fetuses should be aborted or not. But if you looked at his result, it had a, if you had that genetic combination, you had 1.4 chance of being uh, in, admitted into the hospital, and it's never been repeated. So uh, I find it very, very sad, personally, that we have a system that societies have invested so heavily in, but do not listen to the stories. Now, I want to try and talk a little bit about my work. I often describe it as the common world and the private world. And when I talk about psychosis, I'm not referring to it in a sort of a, a, a medical terminology, but to just have a clearer understanding of, of uh, what we are talking about in terms of people going mad, really. So I talk about the, the common world, and generally we have relationships, we belong, we have a sense of meaning, we have a sense of purpose. These things are very, very important to us. If these things are functioning, well, then we are well-functioning in our, in our society uh, and with our families and with our 
friends and things like that. But there is this thing called trauma. And when trauma enters into the, uh, into the equation, things start to happen. Things start to happen to people, especially if you're alone with it. Because what happens is uh, people start to actually disconnect. They start to disconnect from their relationships, from their world, from the, what's meaningful. They start to separate. Many times in the beginning you can't see it. But you, people ex, ex, often explain it as, I began to feel that I was different, I didn't belong. And that increases and increases. And at one point, you, they, people are behind the sort of, I describe it as a glass wall. People can't really see it. And uh, the person behind the glass wall can see out. What they are referring to when they, when they are sort of um, interpreting the outside world through this glass wall is that they're not actually getting any feedback, unable to hear what, what the world is saying back to them, their families, their re uh, friends, or if they're in psychiatry, not being listened to. So well, they would get no reality check. I'm not sure if this is making sense. I was trying to sort of, yeah? Mm? Oh, good. Um, and this leads to uh, this building of a private world. And at one point, often people start to uh, behave more and more bizarrely. And uh, usually that's when people start to think, wow, there's something really wrong with this person. And at some point, that person may enter into, into psychiatry um, and uh, become lost. Now, I, was, I wrote to my title was a bridge builder. We are many bridge builders, and we are many that could potentially be bridge builders. And in fact, when I'm working, uh, that's one of the things that I focus on the most. I try to establish a relationship. And if that doesn't work, then I'm not the right person. And likewise, the other way, the other way around, of course. And one of the things that I, I do is I meet, uh, I focus very much on meeting where people are. So if they have developed a world where aliens and, and chips and things have been placed into their bodies, I meet them there. And uh, in fact, I go and explore with them. And I try and find out why do they experience their world like that. In America, every year there's a five-day congress on aliens and... Uh, they even have a tent for those who have had chips and things put in there. And it's taken very, very seriously. So there, they wouldn't be mad. Right? Many people uh, have connections that believe that they have a spirit world or, or that spirits are speaking to them. That's also considered mad. But, for example, when I've met people there, I've actually gone and found out. I learn an awful lot from, my, from the, the people who've... Uh, allowed me to walk by their side and given me that privilege to share part of their life for a while. I've discovered that uh, there are 23 schools in, in Denmark, clairvoyancy schools. So there are 23 schools where people are learning to speak <laughs> with spirits and voices. So in that context, it's uh, okay. Yeah? So this is where I try, I try and meet people. Now many times they've, they've lost contact, they're suspicious, they're unhappy. And uh, so what I, uh, what I do try to do is focus on bringing people back. I often describe it because many people talk of spirits and, and aliens and very much that sort of thing. So I often describe it as we need to find, find a way to bring you back to planet Earth. And what I do when I'm trying to meet people in their world is I try and see what is it. If it's uh, aliens, I, I try and bring something that's similar. I'm trying to represent it here as a ladder, <laughs> you know, so this uh, person who is, is uh, in extreme distress, is uh, daring now to, to try and open a little window through the glass wall and present their reality, present some of the things that are happening to them. And I will try and meet them with something similar, if that's making sense. Um, and at the same time, I will often be relating, trying to relate it to, to, their, to their world, but also to the things that have happened to them. So, because there is a connection. I have, in all my years, never experienced a, it's out of the blue and has nothing to do with life. So, this is one of the few occasions where I can say never. We do say you should never say always never. What I try to do is, uh, re is to connect these things, to, to bring people back and trying to help them by finding meaning and, uh, and understanding within a context. This is uh, very, very important to me and is 
fortunately, usually quite important for the people I'm trying, trying to help. Then they can come back down the, this ladder and uh, end up, hopefully, and some do, end up actually completely reconnected to the world. Now, that's the ideal situation. Many people continue to hear voices. Many people will continue to believe uh, in aliens and all these sort of things. And I have no problem with that. My, my focus and my goal is to help people uh, exist within what we call the common world with their beliefs, with their understandings, and without fear. Because fear is one of the biggest things that, uh, that trap people. So, um, yeah, what's it like to get a diagnosis? Well, it can be very, very uh, damaging, just to mention myself. <laughs> I think it's very sweet, that one, I do love it. <laughs> yeah. When I was given a diagnosis, it was a person, uh, a man in my case, who sat across from me and said, just words, only words, you are a schizophrenic, you have schizophrenia. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, yes, you do. And he had far more power, and he locked me away for seven months. And during that seven months, my life disintegrated completely. I lost everything that was of value to me. So uh, words are extremely powerful. And the system is extremely powerful, even without evidence, because it is only words that lock me, lock me and lock others away. So what, what happens when you get into, into psychiatry? And uh, how does it affect individuals and society in general? Well, what tends to happen is you get one truth presented. And your truth, unless it complies, uh, can often clash with psychiatry. And you're often given this diagnosis. In my particular field, I'm working with people who, more often than not, get a diagnosis of schizophrenia or uh, treatment, drugs. And uh, the consequences, I actually think Jackie Dillon is, uh, sums it up beautifully. So I'll just quote her, if I can see it here. The reduction of people's distressing life experiences into a diagnosis of schizophrenia means that they're condemned to lives dulled by drugs and blighted by stigma and offered no opportunity to make sense of their experiences. And I think that, unfortunately, is still something. Things have improved, and thank goodness for that. And we and many activists are continuing to fight for it. Many people are trying to, to present knowledge to support what we have expo experienced and talked about for many, many years. But it's still like that, for, for, unfortunately, for, for many. Now, I want to try and sh share some stories with you of people that have had the, the honor, because I consider it a great honor to be able to walk by their sides. And uh, I want to start with, uh, with Peter here. He was 27 years old when I met him. He was completely incoherent to me. I could not understand what he was saying the first time I met him. I literally didn't know what he was saying. And uh, in the end, I, all I said to him when we finished, I said to him, you know what? I don't know what happened to you, but I believe you. And that actually turned out, I found out much later, was one of the most important things for him and resulted that he started to come back again and again. And it was sort of a turning point. Now, within psychiatry, because he'd been in, prior to that, he'd been five years in psychiatry, in and out, forced medication, forced in belts, all kinds of things like that. And um, through, through psychiatry's lens, he was, he, he fulfilled the criteria of schizophrenia. I mean, he heard voices, he was delusional, he talked of signs and codes everywhere in the town, in the streets, through the TV and through um, his telephone. So, I mean, with those glasses, he was a schizophrenic. When you start to, to think about that, you've got a dominant story. They've got somebody who can define your life and you can say, that's it. But of course, there is always another story. There's the story of the person behind that that diagnosis. Um, it turned out that uh, Peter, he had two, two voices. Uh, he had a, a, a voice called the messenger and a, a voice called the informer. His uh, dominant voice, the, the messenger, had a, had a big mission for him. Uh, the mission was that he had to uh, find the code. He needed to find the code 
to save mankind. The, uh, the problem was that if he found the wrong code, he would doom mankind. And this was extremely stressful for him. And uh, the informer, because he actually liked people, every time he tried to approach people, the informer would tell people through the media that he was, uh, he was gay and or a pedophile, which meant that he withdrew. He thought people were talking about him and laughing about him. One of the things that he had was some, some themes. One of, the first theme he had that was running was that he was convinced when he met, uh, met with me was that he suffered from AIDS. And he went to all kinds of tests to check for AIDS and they all came back negative and he all said that it was a conspiracy and they were cheating and they were lying to him. His anxiety level was so extremely high about, high about AIDS that we spent quite a bit of time devising a system whereby he could be tested for AIDS that would convince him that he was not being tampered with. Involved, we had to go to another part of the country and all kinds of things, but we did that. And uh, when he found out that he truly did not have AIDS, he began to, his fear began to reduce. And um, he began to tell of, another diff of a different life, a life of, uh, of uh, trauma. He had been sexually abused from a very early age until he started in school by two, two friends of his parents. They didn't know anything of that. And uh, when he was 12 years old, uh, he was uh, violently raped by a man. And um, one of the things that happened when he was violently raped by a man was that he said something. And the man stopped. In the middle of everything, stopped, went out, and made a cup of coffee. And they sat down in the kitchen in this extremely bar bizarre situation uh, of drinking coffee. And he left. This meant, this had resulted because initially he didn't con uh, so connect the messenger with the rapist. The messenger was telling him to save mankind. But actually what the messenger had, was doing was referring to his feelings of guilt and shame and responsibility because he had had the ability to say the code word and stop it. And he could have done that before if he knew what the code was, code word was. And the thing was, he couldn't remember what it was he had said. But when he began to associate it with that, he realized uh, how, how it was uh, connected. The informer was more tricky uh, because it, it was, turned out that uh, he was gay. The only trouble was that the only men he'd known were abusers. And, to be, and so he associated being gay with being um, uh, an abuser. And he just couldn't accept that. One of the things that helped there was, uh, was a voice hearing group. And uh, he became part of a voice group, hearing group. Many voices who have been sexually abused rarely realize that you can be mechanically stimulated as a, as a boy. It does not mean that you are gay, and it does not mean that you want it, as in his case. But he also met another uh, young man who was suffering from the similar things and, and was trying to work through that he was gay. Today, this uh, young man is uh, working full time. One of the things that's interesting is why did he have no language? Well, when he was in psychiatry, he tried to explain things from his perspective. And the more he explained things, the more mad he was considered. The more mad he was considered, the more he was forced medicated. And, uh, he, re and he continued to refuse to accept that he was a schizophrenic. So what was happening for him was that uh, he thought, I need to find the right words. But since he couldn't find the right words, he lost his language, because then at least he wouldn't say the wrong codes. Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? So um, anyway, so this was one story. I want to talk a little bit about John. Of course, not the, the real names. John uh, came to me, it was his parents. I work very much with people's families. It's very important to me if they can and want to, or, or their close friends, uh, girlfriends, if they have it. But very, most often, it's actually people's families. This young man had been in trouble from school from an, an early age, 11, 12 years old, uh, with drugs, with uh, truancy, stealing, etc. And um, when he was 17, he'd gone mad, and he'd been in the system um, for, since, ever since, really. Um, he, too, did not believe he was a schizophrenic. Um, and um, he, too, uh, objected and was considered more and more mad. And one of the things he did in psychiatry was uh, cover himself in feces, which, of course, is considered absolutely uh, cuckoo. Yeah? So uh, he was defined as absolutely, uh, absolutely mad. But again, he came um, and he uh, 
he didn't say anything, so I told, asked him for initially, would, would you like to hear a little bit about me and what, what I sort of think about things? And uh, he said yes, and so I explained. And then he said to me, or to his parents, that's her. That was all. And then he started to come. And in the beginning, for a whole hour, we'd sit in complete and utter silence. Then one day he did come, and he said three words. He said, disgusting, pedo, and a name. And it turned out that when he'd been about 17 years old, his grandfather died, and his grandfather had abused him. And none of his family knew anything about that. Um, and he instead, when, when the grandfather died, went mad. After he said those three words, he started to talk when he came next time. In fact, uh, he hasn't stopped talking since. <laughs> and one of the things also I think is important here is that um, the family, when I talk with the family, I say, um, because there was tremendous, the family's under tremendous pressure from psychiatry telling them that they are going the wrong way when they approach somebody like myself. And I also say to them, <coughs> yes, it is a risk. There is you, there's me, and that's it. And, uh, and uh, I say to them, but give me six months. And if you don't think that makes any difference, of course, then go back to psychiatry. I will not be harming anybody. Uh, um, so uh, this was one of the ones also where it fortunately turned out well. He is now out of the system and is working part time and is painting and doing all kinds of good things. So Mary, she came to me again also with her family. She had been in uh, juvenile uh, psychiatry or, or youth psychiatry. She was um, living in a, a sort of a home for, for people who are considered uh, seriously ill with schizophrenia. You know, the state pays an awful lot of money for people to live in these uh, institutions. Um, but she spent also most of her time in the closed ward, being force medicated or being placed in belts. Um, when her family came, they, they were desperate. They, they had read, actually, uh, Robert Whittaker's book and were thinking, my daughter cannot, we cannot uh, have her end up being brain damaged and, uh, and a, a ward of the state. So, one of the things when I work with people, because uh, I am critical about medication, so many people do come to me to ask for help to get off drugs. And uh, one of the things I do is uh, I start off and sell them the easiest thing in the world is actually to get off the drugs. The most difficult thing is what you're going to have to do at the same time that you're getting off the drugs. I often use a big piece of, a piece of paper uh, and I threw the pills in the corner, I say, the pills fill this much, tiny little bleep on your life, but they have a big effect on your emotions. This is a blank piece of paper, and this needs, paper needs to be filled out. I tell them also that when you are start to wake up, the problem that got you into psychiatry in the first place is also going to wake up. And we need to look at that. And we need to prepare a, a plan for that. And we need to work with that. And I also tell them that um, uh, uh, we need to do that before the emotions come, because many people who have been drugged on drugs for many years um, experience a, a flatline of emotion. Many have the side effects of, of extreme inner anxiety and agitation, which can confuse, and it confused myself, um, that you still have connection to emotions, but you don't. You actually do not. And if you've been without emotion for many, many years, when the emotions come, and my experience, my, again, no, no science in that, in that department, my experience has been that people, whether they go slowly or, or more fast out of the drugs, at one point, the emotions come and they usually come with a bang. So that's something that needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Another of one of the things that I need to I discuss is uh, how to get out of psychiatry at the same time. And um, this involves, if it's a, a young person, as in this case, I say, so what would you want to do? And the most common answer is, I don't know. And uh, then I say, well, you have two choices. You start school or you find a job. No, nope. <laughs> can't do that. Um, but I tell them, just do that until you find out what you do want to do. And uh, 
that's what usually happens. Now, one of the other very, very important things is uh, I found that the families are so, so important here. Because I have not had any success, I must admit, that uh, with, a, with a young person, if their family is against it. There is so much pressure. I cannot do just my little thing in my office and just meeting up every once a week or whenever, however often people choose. It's not enough. So one of the most important things is I work with the family. In her particular case, she, um, her, her uh, problem that had gotten her into, into the system had been one of the things, big things had been being a perfectionist. She had to get top grades. She had to be perfect in absolutely everything. And uh, we devised a plan that said every single day, once, when you're ready, but it's going to have to start happening when you start getting closer to your emotions, but every single day you have to do something wrong on purpose. <laughs> and this was unbelievably difficult. But she got a lot of support from her family. And uh, gradually she got off the drugs. She's doing well uh, and is, uh, last I heard, studying. Uh, oh, and by the way, when she went to school and started school, um, she, uh, we talked about getting poor grades. Go for them. Live life. <laughs> she did. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think it's very important, the good patient. A very similar story, Tony, but he did not uh, leave psychiatry. He remained in psychiatry. And that is, even if you get off your drugs and everything, you are met with um, a constant barrage of, oh, you can't do this and you're still sick and you're surrounded by this whole psychiatric uh, atmosphere. Um, my experience, again, over the years has been that it is so important to plan when you're getting off your drugs and that you are planning a route out of psychiatry. It doesn't matter if it's working uh, in, in, uh, voluntarily or whatever, but you move out and you move into your own home, even if it's your family home, parents, but you move, you leave psychiatry. Because all that happens again is, uh, like with Tony, he got off his drugs and he was a well-liked patient. That's also very dangerous. And I'd recommend uh, my colleague and friend, Arne Schreiner, who's done a, a thesis on, on, uh, on the, the good patient, because it's actually very difficult to leave psychiatry if you're popular uh, in psychiatry. <laughs> but with the star, no, it is. It's, uh, uh, I could go into that a bit more. And then a final little story. Uh, another one, uh, which I always think is so sad, is uh, an, uh, unfortunately quite typical. A family comes with their teenager, young teenager in her case, she was a 12 or 13. They just want to come by and speak with me because they'd heard that I think differently, but they already have an appointment with psychiatry the next week. And I feel desperate when I meet those kinds of families and I say, don't do it. Don't do it, please do not go that route. She did, um, she heard voices, it was meaningful. Often what I give young people is I collect stones from Native American in America when I go on my vacations. And I gave her a stone a Native American uh, little uh, figure. And um, anyway, I didn't hear anything they left. And actually quite a few years later, uh, I met, met the mother and she burst into tears. And she said to me, I regret every day that I didn't listen to you. And she told that her daughter was now in a psychiatric home on lots of drugs, was put on tons of weight, isolated herself, wouldn't speak with them. But the little stone that she'd had been given from me, she took with her everywhere. And every night, she put it under her pillow. Yeah. Finally, can't have without a butterfly. I love my butterflies. And I often think of psychiatry as uh, we, we, can, we travel along and we're uh, the caterpillar. And at one point, we come the, the cocoon. And one of the great things about the cocoon is that uh, before coming out as a butterfly, uh, the, the caterpillar dissolves completely. And I often think of going mad as, as a form of being dissolved. You go to pieces, you, you, but you have the potential to come out of this huge crisis as something beautiful and as something that you are supposed to be. However, when you are in this state of huge crisis, if you get the wrong kind of help, and psychiatry often steps in here, you're very, very vulnerable. So instead of coming out as the butterfly that you're supposed to be, you step out as a schizophrenic. And I think that's one of the greatest tragedies uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the world, actually. Um, so I think there's an awful lot of things we, 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 need, to, uh, we need to do. And um, that was 
a bit of the personal story and I hope it's a good backdrop for the other people. Thank you so much, Olga. <laughs>